<laughs> what is hypertension? I've had patients tell me hypertension is stress. They're really tense, right? And uh, they thought that's what hypertension was. No, you can actually be very calm and have hypertension because hypertension refers to the pressure in the blood vessel walls. And this is technical. Blood pressure is the force of blood pushing against the walls of arteries as it flows through them. How do we measure it? Did some of you had your, have your blood pressure taken when you came in? Some nurses in the back taking blood pressure. And they put that cuff, that's what they call it, that band around your uh, arm, usually. It can be done in other places too, but they put it around your arm and then put a stethoscope over the blood vessel and pump it up while they see what kind of happens to the pressure. Maybe you've seen the dials. Try it if yourself. Here's what happens. The blood is going through the artery in your arm. It's going past the bend in your arm where the blood vessel gets close to the skin. That's why we put the stethoscope or microphone right over that blood vessel so we can hear. Then the blood vessel is compressed by the uh, blood pressure cup. As the pressure goes up, it squeezes and squeezes and squeezes until that blood vessel is completely closed. Once it's completely closed, then there's no sound at all in the stethoscope. You don't hear anything rushing past. The pressure is let down very, very slowly until the ear first hear the, fir the first squirt of blood going through the opening. Does that make sense? So a little bit of blood squirting through a very tight hole makes a noise. Something like, maybe you've done this, when you're working in the yard with the hose. Um, I've done this, maybe you folks have not I'll take the end of the hose and I'll bend it over, build up the pressure, let a little bit out, and then you can get you hear this loud shh, and then you can really make it spray a distance. Or maybe you've done it with a little hand spray sort of a thing. If you put your ear to the hose, you don't hear anything. But when the water is going from a small opening to a larger one, then you'll hear a noise. And indeed, that's the noise that we listen for is that blood squirting through. And when it first pushes through, what that tells us is the heart is pushing hard enough to get the blood through and past the blockage. So we say that is the highest pressure that your heart is pumping. Is it 100% accurate? No, it's not 100% accurate. If you want 100% accurate, what you have to do is put a catheter in one of the arteries of the body, stick it all the way up into the heart, hook up a pressure transducer to it, and then it'll tell you what the exact one is. But that's not very practical, right? And most of us don't want that done. <laughs> I don't. It's necessary sometimes, and I'm thankful for the technology, but that's not a comfortable way. It's not an easy way. It's not a safe way to do all the time. So we put that cuff on. The highest number, when the blood first starts to squirt through, is called a systolic blood pressure. That's the highest one. Then, whoever's taking the blood pressure, and it might be the machine doing this as well, listens to the sound. You can imagine, as the hole gets larger and larger, the sound changes. Instead of a small hole squirting out, it's a bigger hole and a bigger hole until it's finally wide open. And when it's wide open, then the sound is gone. So the first one we're listening for when the sound first comes, and the second one we're listening until the sound goes away. Now, if we were looking for things that might make our blood pressure inaccurate, uh, what might you think of? What happens if the nurse has a little bit of a hearing problem? You know, that happens sometimes. But what happens if the uh, stethoscope isn't quite in the right place or the microphone? That might throw it off a little bit, right? Especially the lower number, because you're waiting for a sound to disappear. Um, 
The blood pressure should be taken at about the same level as the heart. Right? If you were to bend over and put the arm down low, that would make the pressure go up. If you were to put your arm high in the air, that would tend to make the blood pressure go down in the cup. But what we really want to know is what's happening at your heart. So we would ask you to hope, and that's where your arm is, right? Next to your heart. So we generally do it right there. We could do this same blood pressure in a lot of different areas. You know, sometimes people have a very large arm and it's hard to take a blood pressure. We can actually get a blood pressure that's fairly accurate doing it on the forearm, where it's a little bit narrower. Then you put the stethoscope over one of the arteries in the low arm. But then you have to make sure that it's about heart level, right? You could do it on your ankle, too, and we do that sometimes. Just check the difference between the blood pressures to see if it's okay. The top number is called the systolic. The bottom number is called the diastolic. Diastolic means rest. It's the pressure when the heart is at rest. When the heart gets the opportunity to rest, there is still a little bit of pressure in the heart. I don't remember whether I told you this story. I've told it before. I used to, when I was a kid, my father would take us sometimes on a Saturday afternoon to the coast. We were on California, kind of inland a little bit, northern California. And it took us about an hour and 15 minutes to get there. We would drive over the hills and down through the redwoods. And as we came out, we would go up. Uh, there was kind of a river. We would go up on the bluff. So we got just to the top of the bluff and turned the corner right on the sign, on the, on the corner, were a couple of driveways for houses that looked over the Pacific Ocean. Beautiful setting for a house. One of them had a sign on it that said D-I-A-S-T-O-L-E, diastole. Now, I didn't know what that meant, so I asked my dad, what does that mean? That's a funny name, and I, I said it kind of funny, diastole, something like that. And dad says, that is the vacation home for a cardiologist. <laughs> and diastole means where the, when the heart is at rest. So that seemed like a very fitting name for that particular place, didn't it? So I remember when I was a teenager what diastole meant. That's the resting phase. So we got the top number where the heart is pushing the hardest, and we have the bottom number where the heart is resting. Do you think if that bottom number is high, that's good for the heart? Well, we need a little bit of blood, certainly, flowing, but if it's too high, that could be, the heart's not having an opportunity to rest. It's still under pressure. If the top number goes too high, that makes the heart work harder, too, doesn't it? And if that top number goes too high, you might imagine that there could be breaks in blood vessels. The pressure was too much and the pipe popped. Why, that would cause a bleed somewhere. And maybe you've heard of things like that. Have you heard of a stroke? Uh, sometimes we have problems in the heart, too, just because, like a heart attack, because it's been stretched too hard. Okay, let's have a look at the numbers. Hypertension is classified as normal, high normal, mild, moderate, severe, and very severe. Normal, 130 over 85 and below. Now, is there something that's too low for your blood pressure? Well, if there's not enough blood reaching your head, then it's too low. And you know what happens when there's not enough blood reaching your head? You faint. <laughs> okay. So, if, like, when you stand up, you're, uh, you kind of get dizzy, there may be your, the blood isn't quite reaching your head. And that might be a little low. Otherwise, lower is better. You know, the kids come in sometimes with their top number, their systolic, at 60 or 70, 80. I've seen, I, it's not uncommon, although it's, well, it's not rare, but it's a bit uncommon to have adults that are down in the 90 range. But I see it occasionally, even those that are not on that occasion. When we start to get high normal, then it's the 130 up to the 140 range in the top number. Mild is 140 to 160. Moderate is 160 to 
to 180, 180 to 210. Oh, that's getting pretty high, isn't it? Doesn't that sound scary? And then very severe is 210 and up. Those numbers are very dangerous because it's, you can pop a blood vessel at those levels. And we like to get these, especially those over 200, taken care of in an emergent fashion. You should be in the emergency room getting that blood pressure down. Some of these others, we have a little more time. You know, we've got two or three months. We've got several weeks to months to manage many of these. But uh, when it gets very high, it is an emergency. Blood pressure is a very slow killer. It's, it's not something that most people feel. Generally, you would not have a headache from your blood pressure until that blood pressure gets over about 200. It's much more likely that your blood pressure is up because you have a headache, right? Because anything that tends to make the blood vessels a little stronger or tighter will tend to make the blood pressure go up. So, generally, we don't feel it, and with time it adds up. The blood vessels begin to get stiff, and they get thick in the wall. The heart has to work hard, and it gets uh, bigger, and tends to get larger, and there's stress put on the blood vessels. The lower your blood pressure is, the healthier you are. The higher your blood pressure, the more your risk of heart attack and stroke goes up. There is no number that says, if I'm below this number, I'm safe. Or if I'm above this number, I'm in danger. The lower you get it, the less your risk of heart attack and stroke. The higher it goes, the higher the risk. Now, when I was in residency, we used to talk about, oh, it's fine, up to 150, 160, 140. Oh, that's great. Those are the numbers that we said. And that's what we were taught. What we came to recognize that that was that that number was chosen simply because at 140, around 140, is when your risk of stroke and heart attack had increased 50%. So that's not good enough, is it? Which is why we've lowered the numbers. If you happen to have diabetes, we, uh, we want the, uh, or kidney problems, we'd like that closer to 120 or 110. So doctors like to get that down because we want to decrease your risk of heart attack and stroke, even kidney damage. Uh, any questions about what we've covered so far? Does it make sense to you? Yes? Does blood pressure change a lot throughout the day when you're sleeping at night, or does it more or less stay People get home? very frustrated, okay? This is what happens when you go to the doctor, right? You're, you're there on time. You sit in the waiting room and you begin to, you know, the steam begins to come out of your ear because you've been waiting for 45 minutes, right? Finally, you know, someone else has gone before you and you start to steam a little more. Then the nurse calls you in, sits you down, and says, take your blood pressure. Now, technically, in order to get up blood pressure, it's supposed to be the resting, calm blood pressure. Technically, all the studies, you're supposed to sit quietly, for five minutes and think about Hawaii or something, okay? <laughs> something very calm and, and get your calm pressure and then take the blood pressure. Well, it's not often done that way in the doctor's office. So it tends to be up. And it will vary. It would have been different in the waiting room than it was when you were walking in. And when you're sitting there and that cuff goes up, if you're worried, that may change it as well. So all kinds of things change it. Going up and down the stairs. Uh, it's a very dynamic sort of thing. Some people are very frustrated because the nurse got something that was different than what they got at home or different than what they got in another doctor's office. It goes up and down all the time. You know those people that you've seen these uh, uh, Olympic athletes that will pick up incredible amounts of weight and lift them? When those athletes do that, their blood pressure goes up to some of them 300. Just all the strain. Our body adjusts for whatever we're doing. God has made it that way. It's blood pressure that's up for a long time that causes problems. So what we want to do is find out that resting blood pressure and make sure that it gets, it, it is not sneaking up. And that's what we're supposed to be uh, treating. What about during sleep? Generally when we sleep it goes down, but it could go up if you had, for example, sleep apnea. 
Have you heard of that? Kind of stop breathing at night, then there's not enough oxygen, your heart starts to beat fast. If your blood sugar went, there are a lot of things. So yes, it varies. In REM sleep, I would expect it to change a little bit as well. But blood pressure is a very dynamic process. And so don't expect the numbers to be the same every time. They, they do, they move around. And if your blood pressure is a little high, then calm down. Think about, I need to say Hawaii when you're <laughs> Think about some place very calm and nice, a beautiful sunset or something, and then take that blood pressure again. It tends to go up and down. Of course, if you're worried and anxious all the time, that may make your blood pressure up a little more. So a calm and quiet spirit might be a good thing to help with blood pressure, right? So that's kind of the story on uh, blood pressure, how we measure it. What is it that puts us at risk for having high blood pressure? Well, here's a list of uh, risk factors. Age over 60. Now, we know from the scientific literature that being over 60 years of age does not guarantee that you will have high blood pressure. But there's something about living in our Western society that goes on that and the older we get, the more likely we are to have it. Males tend to have more high blood pressure than females. Now, we're looking at the population, not necessarily causes, but things that put us at risk. Race, in particular, uh, African Americans tend to run a little higher in blood pressure. And uh, we don't know all the reasons for that, but we have some ideas. Uh, there may be a little bit of a genetic piece here. There may be some other lifestyle factors as well. For example, if someone in their culture, this doesn't have to be African Americans, it can be all over, it kind of varies. If some people eat a lot of junk food as part of their culture, and not a lot of fruits and vegetables, one shouldn't be surprised to find the blood pressure a little bit higher, no matter who they are or where they are. But if a population group tends to choose things that are unhealthy, then that population group might, that might make a difference. Another interesting thing that I heard, I've heard twice in medical lectures, no way to prove it, but one of the thoughts is that uh, when African Americans were brought as slaves across from Africa, they came in slave ships. And slave ships were pretty bad. People were chained together, everybody got dysentery, and only those who were best able to hang on to sodium lived. So then by the time they got to what we call the New World, now everybody has the genes for hanging on to sodium. So it tends to make their blood pressure go up. So that is a possibility. It may be why the blood pressure medication that pulls sodium out of the body tends to work better for African Americans. So race can make a difference. Heredity. If your parents had high blood pressure, you might as well. Salt sensitivity. Now, I'm going to say quite a bit more about this later. Some people are more sensitive to salt than others. If, you, if someone who is salt sensitive has salt, their blood pressure tends to go up more. Someone who is not salt sensitive, they eat salt and their blood pressure doesn't really go up that much. And so there's a difference between these, uh, these people. Uh, and we thought maybe it was genetic. The way that we test for it is uh, very, uh, well it's research, you don't want to do this. What they do is they, uh, put you on a very, very low salt diet. And then they give, the research subjects, then they give a water pill to take out even more sodium, they check your blood pressure, then they give you a bunch of sodium, and see if your blood pressure goes up. Okay. And if it goes up enough, they say you're salt sensitive. If it doesn't go up very much, they say you're not salt sensitive. Well, it's a very important principle, but people who are salt sensitive uh, are more likely to have hypertension and have trouble. We'll come back to that. Obese people are more likely to have high blood pressure. Those of you who have been to my previous talks have heard something, especially when we talked about diabetes, have heard about this thing, uh, maybe metabolic syndrome, that is, it is uh, the pre-diabetes. And there's a bunch about, on the way to, to diabetes, the obesity, brings hypertension along. 
So people who are overweight tend to be more salt sensitive. People who are overweight tend to have higher blood pressures for a variety of different reasons. Insulin uh, resistance may have something to do with that and uh, uh, the ability of the body to hang on to sodium. For example, if your insulin levels are high, your kidneys will hang on to the sodium. Now, I keep talking about sodium and haven't told you a lot about it. Sodium tends to raise the blood pressure because it holds water in the blood vessels. If you think of your uh, heart as a pump, you think of your blood vessels as pipes, if the blood pressure is going to go up, you're going to either turn the pump up harder, right? Or uh, you could make the pipes smaller. We can do that in the body. Or we can increase the amount of water in the pipes, right? When we take sodium, sodium tends to sit, go into our blood. In our blood, it pulls the water in, so it increases the amount of fluid in the pipes. And so you'd expect the blood pressure to go up. So when I talk about sodium, I'm really talking about its ability to hold water in the body. Now that is not perfect. I can tell you that uh, the body adjusts and uh, I can manage that. Inactive lifestyle is an associated heavy alcohol consumption and use of oral contraceptives. Now this is a rather mild sort of thing, but there is a, a small association. Well, what causes hypertension? Those are kind of risk factors. What actually causes it? That's the big question. Any guesses as to what the most common cause of high blood pressure is? Well, the scientific literature calls it essential hypertension. And 90 to 95% of people with, essential high, with high blood pressure have essential hypertension. And do you know what essential means? It means essentially we don't know what caused it. <laughs> it's kind of a strange sort of word. And, and that was true for a good number of years. What, what we're learning now is this whole business of metabolic syndrome, gaining weight, high insulin, is the cause of almost all of this essential hypertension. So we'll talk more about that lifestyle piece. But that's where most high blood pressure comes from. Not all, but most, 90 to 95%, is this metabolic syndrome, which is identified as essential. Uh, that's the uh, common thing. Then now the next one is renal artery stenosis. The kidneys are in charge of long-term management for the blood pressure. The kidneys adjust how much sodium is in the blood, how much water, how much, a bunch of stuff. So that's the kidney's job. And the kidney wants to keep the blood pressure about right, and it wants to, keep, wants to keep the fluid and everything just the way it's supposed to. So it measures the blood coming in, and it says we need to throw away water or we need to keep water. We need to throw away sodium or we need to keep sodium. The kidney is the manager of the long-term blood pressure. What happens if a blood vessel that goes to the kidney is narrow? Has anybody ever heard of atherosclerosis? You know the stuff that causes heart attacks in our brains, or in our hearts, or strokes in our brains? Same stuff can affect the blood vessel that goes to the kidney. And if the kidney has a blockage, the kidney will say, there's not enough pressure to get the blood to me like it's supposed to. And it'll start sending out little chemical messages, raise the blood pressure, raise the blood pressure, raise the blood pressure. I had a lady come to see me several years ago. She uh, was frustrated. She, she didn't have diabetes. She was a little overweight, but not bad. She tried to live a healthy lifestyle, but her blood pressure kept going up. And she said, I'm going to commit to uh, making a lifestyle change. I really don't want to use medication. So I helped her as best I could. And we gave it all we could. After two weeks, her blood pressure was a move. Blood pressure sometimes takes a couple of weeks to start to come down. And I said to her, I think maybe you have a renal artery stenosis. Let's do a check. And so we did. And sure enough, that's what the blockage was. Until the kidney stopped giving that message, make the blood pressure go up because it needed it. It needed the fluid to, throw, to flow through the kidney. 
the kidney was going to be sending those messages and the heart and the rest of the blood vessels were going to be responding. What, what did we do? Why, we sent her to uh, an interventional, uh, I think radiologist at the time that did it. They, they put in, they did, have you heard of an angioplasty? They did an angioplasty on her renal artery, the artery to her kidney. It opened up. She didn't need her medication anymore. So that's, that was another cause of hypertension. While most people come in with essential hypertension, we hate to miss one of these other causes, right? Let's go through the rest of them. Cushing syndrome is a, is a problem when you have too much cortisol. You can take that from taking too much, for example, prednisone by mouth. That would tend to make the blood pressure go up. Or it could be a tumor in your own adrenal gland. Uh, another part of the adrenal gland has aldosterone in it, and that can do it. So mostly adrenal gland here. Here's some blood vessel diseases, which I, I mentioned some, there are others. It gets a little too complicated. High thyroid can make that difference. And there are some medications that can raise your blood pressure. Has anybody ever heard of uh, phenylephrine? It's a medicine that uh, you can purchase for taking care of a cold. Right? There's some of these things you spray in your nose to help uh, keep your nose from running, that can make your blood pressure go up. Um, sometimes cold medicine can make your blood pressure up. And you're, if you have hypertension, your doctor probably told you, don't take the cold medicine unless you've talked to me. Because some of those. Others are cocaine. I know you don't think of that as a medication. But uh, the ENT doctors still occasionally will use it in your nose uh, to help uh, for procedures. And then here's a surprise one, licorice. If you eat a lot of licorice, it can tend to make your blood pressure go up as well because it tends to affect how the body deals with potassium and sodium. Occasionally, I find somebody who's really addicted to the stuff, and, and uh, I guess, so I ask the question in the office. Uh, that can uh, tend to make the uh, blood pressure go up as well. It's not really a medication, but uh, one should pay attention to it. So if you have high blood pressure, the most likely cause is essential hypertension that is caused by the lifestyle. Too much energy in, you're tending to gain weight, the cholesterol is up, and as those things happen, your blood pressure tends to go up too. That's most of it. If we're going to look at lowering blood pressure, we want to take care of things that uh, are simple, certainly going to make it go up. And here's one that I haven't spoken to yet that I suppose we should, and that's uh, the alcohol uh, and there's another one in pregnancy, something we call preeclampsia. Smoking tends to make the uh, uh, blood pressure go up. One of the, the first thing one needs to do if, they're, if they have high blood pressure and they smoke is to quit smoking. This is a very uh, potent tool that makes blood vessels uh, uh, really very sick and tends to, the chemicals in it, the nicotine is a stress on the heart, tends to make the blood pressure go up. The second and, uh, uh, is weight loss. For every pound of weight you carry, and this is, I haven't ever measured this myself, I've been told this, maybe you've heard it. Every pound of fat that you carry is one more mile of blood vessels, little tiny capillaries. So the more your body has to fill, the harder it has to work and the pressure tends to go up. So, it, uh, uh, makes sense to lose weight. Often, just losing 5, 10 pounds will help that weight come down. So, uh, there have been uh, numerous studies done uh, looking at this uh, particular <coughs> relationship. Uh, I have one here on uh, my speaking screen that uh, tells me of a study done uh, uh, on some females who are over 18 years of age. Uh, their BMI was, when you compare them, those with a high BMI, the weight that was high, had twice the hypertension as those that had the lower BMI. And of course, the sleep apnea that comes with obesity also tends to increase blood pressure. So, uh, weight loss is going to be important from that standpoint. Uh, Here's a uh, kind of a look at a 
scientific study reported in, uh, from the Framingham study in Archives of Internal, Internal Medicine 2005. It took people, now, people with uh, incidental hypertension, or that essential kind, if they lost 1.8 kilograms. Now, 1 kilogram is about 2.2 pounds, so 1.8 is going to be somewhere around 4 to 5 pounds. To lose 4 to 5 pounds, and in those aged 50 to 65, there was a significant decrease, about a 26% decrease in uh, blood pressure, or the number of people with high blood pressure. So that is a, uh, some evidence. We'll, we'll uh, try it again and, and uh, try to increase that weight loss now to closer to 10 pounds, okay? Maybe even 15 here. And you can see there's a 37% decrease in the number of people with hypertension. So weight loss in the scientific literature is demonstrated as a good way to help your weight or your blood pressure come down. Any questions about that? Does it make sense to you? Yeah. If you think of it as a whole bunch of blood vessels, and as you lose the weight, the blood vessels can kind of shrink up because they're not needed. Now the heart doesn't have to work so hard. Then it kind of makes sense. So you're going to quit smoking, you're going to lose weight, and you're going to increase your exercise. Regular exercise means less heart disease. Uh, it tend to exercise, it's hard for people to, sometimes they, they aren't aware of the, uh, how potent this is in helping your heart. When you first start to exercise, say so you've been sitting in a chair, you get up and start to exercise. As you're walking, you, your blood pressure will go up a little bit. And then when you get to that little bit of a moderate level, the blood vessels in your muscles will open up wide and the blood pressure drops. Now if you keep exercising harder and harder and harder, pretty soon that blood pressure will start to go up again. A good place to exercise is in that dip, right? That's a great place. And if you will exercise, your blood pressure will stay lower for something like 8 to 12 hours. So if you exercise in the morning, your blood pressure is going to be lower the rest of the day. Interestingly enough, it does not correlate with how hard you exercise. It does correlate with how long you exercise. So if you just do moderate exercise, taking a good walk for 30 to 45 minutes will significantly lower your blood pressure through the rest of the day. Great information, don't you think? Yes. So, besides that, exercise tends to get rid of the stress hormones. It's a great antidepressant, right? And as the hormones that tend to make your the stress hormones that tend to make your blood pressure go up are brought down as you do physical exercise. If it's in the moderate range. If you get up too high, so you're really stretching and puffing and huffing, and your heart's having to work extra hard, then the blood pressure will go up. But in that moderate range is where you get the most benefit. So blood pressure is uh, beneficial. Now the next one down here is restrict sodium. I'm going to tell you the party line at present on sodium. I've been doing some research into the scientific literature on sodium. And I will tell you that I have questions about the validity of what is commonly told us about sodium. So let's talk about sodium. We've already mentioned that if sodium is in your blood, it tends to hold the water in. And if there's more water in the pipes, then your blood pressure would, you'd expect it to go up. And indeed, that's what happens. If you are eating a low sodium diet, and you're a normal person with a little bit of, or somebody with hypertension. If you take a bunch of sodium, your water will, your, your body will retain more water, and your blood pressure will go up a little bit. On average, about three or four millimeters of mercury. So if your blood pressure is 130, it might go up to 133 or 135. If you're salt sensitive, it might go up 10 or 15 points. But if you kept taking that amount of sodium over several days, you're, and you had enough water, 
your kidneys would adjust and your blood pressure would come, for most people, would come right back down to normal. So a lot of people are surprised about that. So we don't want too much sodium. Too much sodium can lead to problems. The scientific literature tells us this. But there's also some evidence that too little sodium can also cause significant problems. So let's talk about this restricting sodium. And I'm going to tell you the party line first, and then I'll tell you a little more of some of the things I've discovered and try to put them in perspective. I think you'll appreciate it as uh, good news by the time that uh, we're done. Let's see, I have just a little bit more in my uh, notes here. Um, and I want to remind myself exactly what I put down in my notes. Uh, a bunch of salt fed to people. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next one here. Okay, here's the salt story. One gram of sodium. Did the doctor ever tell you you need a one gram or two gram sodium diet? One gram of sodium is about 2,500, I'm sorry, 1,000 milligrams is the same as one gram. It's the same as 2.5 grams or 2,500 milligrams of salt. Because salt is made up of two things. What is it? you remember? Sodium and chloride. And the chloride is 60% of the weight, and the sodium is 40% of the weight. So when the doctor says, I want you on a 2-gram sodium diet, what he, what he or she is saying is then you get about 5 grams of salt, or 5,000 milligrams of table salt. Does that make sense? Even the doctors get confused about this. So salt is 40% sodium by weight. One fourth teaspoon of salt is about uh, one fourth is about 1.5 gram, which is about 590 milligrams of sodium. So one teaspoon of salt is about equivalent to one gram of sodium. So that gives you, I think, a practical ballpark. When the doctor says two grams of sodium, that means about two teaspoons of salt. And that would be level teaspoons, not heaping ones. <laughs> Any questions about that? I've seen doctors confused. I've been confused over this. Okay, Because we talk about on two grams of sodium, well, and then two grams of salt. No, that's not quite right. And uh, this, is, this is kind of where it should add up. So that gives you a, a picture of the amount of salt that is asked for. Let's see where we get it in our diet. Uh, well, we could get it from just plain salt. And where do you find salt in foods? It seems to be in especially prepared foods, canned foods, for example. One of the highest, uh, well, of course, you go to caviar, you're talking about almost pure salt, right? I mean, it's really salty. If you look in the kind of the plant products, the uh, plant side of things, getting away from the fish, uh, one of the highest salt one is canned chickpeas. End up being really high. And a lot of the beans are very high in salt. If you were trying to lower the salt in your diet, uh, how could you uh, adjust to those uh, particular foods to get the salt out? You could cook them fresh yourself and then add a little salt to taste. That would be reasonable. Then you have control of the salt because there's not a lot of sodium in the beans themselves. Another thing is, uh, is uh, canned, like green beans. One of the things you can do is pour off the water and add your own water to kind of heat it in so you get rid of the salt that's in the water. That's something that can help. Those TV dinners, have you ever seen those things? Ooh, those are high in salt. Check them out. Often you'll have one and a half times your whole day's worth of sodium in one TV dinner. So. Uh, Cheese often has a lot of salt in it. So there's a lot of salt hidden in the foods. Look at your labels to find out how much you're getting, and then look for ways to decrease it. Anybody ever heard of monosodium glutamate, MSG? Well, that has sodium in it. It uh, gives you some nice flavor, 
it's just one sodium along with the glutamate, so it's not too bad, but it still a, uh, has sodium. Baking soda, have you ever seen or heard of that? That often uses other sodium salts. Baking powder as well. And then there are some other things. Maybe you've seen these la in labels. Disodium phosphate, yes. Sodium alginate, sodium benzoate, sodium hydroxide, sodium nitrate. You, the sodium is all there. And these kind of uh, additives uh, are generally on the small side. There's not a lot of them, but they each add a little bit of sodium. Uh, sodium nitrate, for example, in cured meats and sausages. Uh, you see sodium hydroxide is uh, to soften and loosen the skins off of olives, some fruits and vegetables. Sodium benzoate is a preservative, relishes and sauces. Sodium alginate, used in many chocolate milks and ice creams to make a smooth texture. And then the disodium phosphate is in quick cooked cereals and processed cheeses. Sodium propionate is used in pasteurized cheese. The propionate itself is actually good for you. The sodium may be a concern. Sodium sulfite is used to uh, help uh, bleach some fruits and you can get quite a bit. If you would like to uh, see these slides and have a copy of them, and actually there's a whole uh, sodium in foods handout on my website. Now it, it's turned yellow, so it's very hard to see, isn't it? www.aclm-articles.net And if you look in there under sodium, you should be able to find the uh, sodium in foods handout. So, What's that again? I'm sorry, it's in yellow, and it's hard for me to control the color because it, the machine kind of does it. It's Bill Gates that I think is falling. <laughs> <laughs> www.aclm-articles.net. ACLM stands for American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Dash, and then articles, because I've got a lot of scientific articles in there, and then .net. If you look under sodium, you can, you can get that, that list of foods that are, are very high in sodium. Okay. Any other questions about the amount of sodium in food? Yes? If we have the salt, you know, if you don't want to take salt, you have to have salt. You need salt in your body. If you don't have enough salt in your body, there can be significant problems. And I'll say a little bit about that before we're done, because we have risks on both the high end and the low end for uh, sodium. It's dangerous to have too much, and it's dangerous not to have enough. Now, I want to say something to get to that point. I want to talk about this salt sensitivity. People who are most likely to be sensitive to sodium are those that are older, African Americans, obese, those with metabolic syndrome, and then family history, uh, some kidney problems, cholesterol problems, the dyslipidemia, and then, of course, chronic kidney disease. Sodium sensitivity is a fascinating sort of a thing. As I began to learn about sodium sensitivity, I discovered that it is completely reversible. It's not something that you have to have. There may be a genetic predisposition, but it is completely reversible. It ends up that sodium sensitivity may be more important, or at least as important, as hypertension in, as a cause of death. People, for example, who have high blood pressure and normal sodium sensitivity have the same death rate as those that have normal blood pressure with salt sensitivity. Some people have normal blood pressure and salt sensitivity. Those people are going to die younger and sorry, sooner as well. Now, if you really want to get bad, you get high blood pressure and uh, sodium sensitivity. So what do we have to do to get rid of it? The science tells us that what we have to do is add, first, potassium, and second, potassium bicarbonate. Now, you've probably heard of potassium. Some of you are probably taking potassium pills. And potassium can be very helpful in helping to reverse the potassium or the sodium sensitivity. 
When you get it as potassium bicarbonate, where are you going to get potassium bicarbonate? Fruits and vegetables, whole grains. That is the most common kind of salt within food is the way God has made them. So as you eat lots of fruits and vegetables, it makes so, uh, the sodium sensitivity dissolve away, which is quite impressive. Can't you overdose yourself on potassium? Yes, you can, especially if you have kidney problems. And for most of us who are, quote, healthy, that is, we don't have severe kidney failure, because the potassium problem in kidney failure really doesn't start until it gets very severe. So even with mild kidney failure, it's not as bad. If we get it from fruits and vegetables, we're safe. It does well. When you have real bad kidney failure, sometimes they'll limit potassium in foods. You have to stay away from things that are high in potassium, like bananas or oranges or tomatoes, right? But uh, for most of us, uh, with relatively normal kidney function, lots of fruits and vegetables are not a problem. Has anybody ever heard of salt substitute? Yeah. yeah, you were going to ask about that. Or they have a no salt or a low salt. Low salt is half sodium chloride and half potassium chloride. No salt is all potassium chloride. And especially people who are on some medications like uh, captopril or uh, what we call the ACE inhibitors, if you use too much of that, it's like taking a potassium pill. It's much better to get it in the plants. So you can use that as a tool, but I wouldn't use lots and lots of it. It could cause some problems. It does make sense to move the sodium to the potassium, but I'd rather you get it from the fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. Any other questions? Lots of potassium bicarbonate, lots of fruits and vegetables, tends to reverse sodium sensitivity and help the blood pressure come down. That is very good news. One of the first studies done to look at sodium and health uh, was, let's see, they call that the, the INSALT, I think, study, I-N-S-A-L-T. They looked at a whole bunch of countries intake and their blood pressures. And what they found, it went at one end to countries like Papua New Guinea and the rainforest of Brazil, as they looked at different populations, these people had very low sodium and had very high intakes of plants. And then they went to the Western cultures, where they had higher amounts of junk food and much less plant. And in that spectrum, they found that the more uh, salt, the higher the risk of uh, hypertension, of, of, of stroke and death and the heart attack and those types of things. So uh, they, that was our first intimation that too much salt might increase your risk of heart attack. It was a bit of a surprise to find out as I researched this that if you took off the three or four countries on the very low end that ate, ate a whole lot of fruits and vegetables, if people were too low in their salt, they could actually increase their risk of dying. It looks like there's a bit of a J curve. That is, if your salt gets too low, your risk of dying goes up. And if your salt goes too high, your risk of dying goes up. When your salt is too low, it tends to increase the nerve sensation. We call it sympathetic nerve uh, tone to the blood vessels, making them smaller and tend to making the blood pressure go up. It also activates the system we call the renin angiotensin system, which is tr supposed to try to raise the blood pressure. Come on, it's got to be up a little higher. It needs to be a little higher. And that particular system can make atherosclerosis worse. And that may be part of the reason. And then it tends to make, when your salt is way too low, it tends to make your insulin resistance worse. So it tend, could make even diabetes a little worse and make hypertension worse by that mechanism. Now you've probably never heard this before. People always said, lower your salt, lower your salt. I wanted to know how low is too low, right? How, low, how high is too high and where's the middle? From the uh, literature so far, we know that people who are overweight uh, 
getting the sodium lower is protective. People who are normal weight, getting the sodium too low may make them worse instead of better. So it's not clear across the board. Everybody, uh, it's safe to have very low sodium. People who have kidney failure, people who uh, have congestive heart failure, for example, and people that are really overweight uh, should be careful about uh, getting too high. That is, they can do better with lower sodiums. But for the most of us, if we drink plenty of water and we get our fruits and vegetables, we can have a moderate amount. Where is that moderate amount? And that's kind of the big question that I've been trying to figure out. We don't have enough literature to be able to know for sure, but it's somewhere between two grams of sodium a day and around four or five grams of sodium a day. It's somewhere in that range that our body can adjust. If we start to go higher than that, there's problems. If we start to get lower than that in populations, there's problems. In animal studies, if you get the sodium too low, they start to die sooner from complications. So we need salt and we shouldn't remove it completely from our diet. I've had people, uh, people who were very compliant with their doctor's recommendation. You need a low salt diet and I want it really low. And they get really good at getting it low. They take it all out of their diet. I've seen they come in with sodiums that are very, very low. So low that it's causing symptoms. So I tell them you have to increase a little bit. That can be a little bit dangerous. At the same time, you don't want a whole lot. So it, that range in the middle is where one needs to be. You wish I could be more specific, right? I guess what I'm trying to say is the best way to manage this is to eat lots of fruit and vegetables and use salt moderately. Don't highly restrict it because there's danger on that end. If you have congestive heart failure, if you have kidney disease, that's a different story. Follow your doctor's direction. But for most of us, our body knows how to adjust. And if you take moderate amounts. The average American, according to science, takes about three and a half grams of sodium a day. 3.5 grams. And the doctor will ask you to restrict down to about two uh, I wouldn't want to go any lower than that. I, it's probably safer to be around two and a half for those of you that really need to restrict it. And I don't know that I would want it to go any lower than that. So, but avoid lots and lots of it. Men tend to take more salt than women, right? Uh, and so their level tends to be a little higher and of course maybe that's why men have a little more problem because once you start to get up to five, six, seven, eight grams, some of the studies have been up to 11, 12, 15 grams of sodium today. It's incredible. When you start to get up really high, then there's an increase in heart disease. Okay? <clears throat> Any questions about that? I, I mean, I've stepped on, I, I've probably brought you some new thoughts. My opinion is doctors should not spend so much time trying to get people to decrease their sodium if they don't have congestive heart failure or kidney disease. They need to encourage people to eat more plants. That would be a whole lot better because you can completely reverse sodium sensitivity by eating plenty of plants. And that, that I think, should be the biggest emphasis. We don't have to talk about what not to eat. We can talk about you need to eat a lot more fruits and vegetables. And that will tend to reverse your salt sensitivity. And those people who have tried it find that their blood pressure tends to come down too. So that's uh, encouraging. Well, if I don't see any more hands, I'm going to move on to the next slide here. So we're going to quit smoking. We're going to lose weight. We're going to exercise, restrict uh, potassium. Uh, yes. Somebody's after me. <clears throat> We're going to uh, increase potassium. We've talked about that. Increasing calcium can help as well. When people are low in calcium, when you do calcium, you should also do magnesium as well. So <clears throat> if you put somebody on a low sodium diet, the average drop in blood pressure the top number is about three to four, maybe, millimeters of mercury. It's not very much. Low single digits. Potassium, uh, replacing the potassium is at least as important as lowering the sodium. And then increasing calcium and magnesium can also be very beneficial. For many, since many people are deficient in magnesium, 
that can be uh, very helpful. That, uh, and that has been helpful for more than one person. So our lifestyle needs to change. We've gotten uh, kind of low in calcium in our diets, although milk is helping to keep it up. But magnesium tends to go low, and we aren't getting enough potassium. This is a, uh, from a scientific article looking at how sodium affects the diet. You can see here's hypertension, this essential hypertension down here. We're trying to understand how they all work together. And we're not going to look at all the lines. It would be too confusing. But look here. The Western diet is high in sodium, high in chloride, low in potassium, and low in this bicarbonate, and uh, it's high in the hydrogen. So fruits and vegetables have a lot of this potassium bicarbonate. Meat makes a lot of this. This pattern tends to cause essential hypertension by a whole bunch of different pathways. And we're trying to understand how those all work together. You might be surprised to find out that kidney stones come in here, that osteoporosis comes in here as well. So these diseases are all kind of linked together. And sodium, high sodium, can be part of the Western lifestyle that tends to be making blood pressure worse. Lifestyle treatment. Get off of the caffeine. Caffeine tends to raise blood pressure. Green or black tea, the, the, the caffeine tends to be a problem. So you want to avoid the caffeine teas. Increasing fiber tends to lower the blood pressure, as per the scientific literature. Uh, fish oil, the omega-3 fats, can help lower the blood pressure a little bit. Uh, antioxidants, like vitamins A, C, and E. Uh, Beta-carotene was found to be associated with low blood pressure in the NHAN study. Beta-carotene comes from yellow vegetables and yellow fruits, right? It's the coloring in those foods. Uh, vitamin C is kind of uh, plus yes in some studies, and well, we can't tell it makes any difference in others. Vitamin E doesn't seem to make as much difference as we would like. Of course, stress reduction is important, and then avoid drugs that raise blood pressure. Stress reduction, exercise is one of the best things for that, and of course, planning your life to best manage that. Avoid alcohol. I mentioned the cocaine, uh, ephedra, and uh, licorice uh, previously. And remember, to get your blood pressure down, take lots of potassium bicarbonate. And look at all the fruits and vegetables and whole grains that tend to help us with that. The more fruits and vegetables and whole grains, the better off your life is going to be as far as blood pressure is concerned. Where's my banana? You know, <clears throat> bananas could be in there, but there, weren't, there wasn't room for pictures of everything. So I thought I would just show you some nice color from the plant kingdom and say, that's where you get what you need. Perform regular, moderate exercise, maintain a normal body weight, limit alcohol, reduce dietary sodium, certainly to reasonable level, somewhere between around two and maybe four uh, grams a day. Get plenty of potassium, fruit, vegetables, uh, low fat dairy, low fat, or low saturated fats, because saturated fats make it worse, and, and low uh, total fat. This is from Dr. Kaplan. Dr. Kaplan is a, um, one of the nationally known researchers on hypertension who was asked to do a review article on what the lifestyle treatment of hypertension. And I used his uh, uh, work as uh, kind of the basis, basic outline for my uh, lecture here. <clears throat> yes, sir? I'd just like to find out about uh, decaf coffee. About decaf coffee. Yeah. Well, decaf, it's the caffeine, is my understanding, it tends to raise the blood pressure. So, uh, but it, coffee also raises cholesterol, and it's not the caffeine that does it. So while the decaf won't be so hard on your blood pressure, it may still be a problem on your cholesterol. Yes, ma'am. When, when you talked about the vitamins, something you didn't add there was vitamin D. I didn't say anything about vitamin D. You're right. But you were at the last lecture, and you know no, you weren't. Low vitamin D can cause a disease called hyperparathyroidism, which can be a cause of hypertension. Okay? So, yes, I've had some people who had low vitamin D as the cause of their hypertension. 
So that can be a difference. And you're right, that wasn't on the list. I need to put it on there, don't I? So I'll fix that slide before next time. Yes, ma'am. I read something this week that said 10 minutes in the sun will give you the vitamin D. Well, that uh, is um, probably not quite enough. We certainly don't want to burn. And that's for the old levels before we knew about the new levels. And so I think it's probably a little more than that. Uh, I end up taking a supplement because I work indoors all the time. I try to get out as much as I can, but it wasn't enough. My level was low. I don't think low enough to raise my blood pressure, but it was low. Yes, ma'am? You said caffeine raises cholesterol? Yeah, well, the, the uh, coffee raises cholesterol. Yes. Well, we think that it is the tannic acid in it that tends to do that. We don't know for sure, but people who drink coffee tend to have higher cholesterol levels. Oh, you didn't want to hear that, did you? <laughs> I retract it. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, fish oil is uh, omega-3. Flaxseed oil is also an omega-3, and that would be reasonable. The flaxseed itself, if you take the whole flaxseed, if you grind it, that's a little different, but if you eat the whole flaxseed, it's just going to go right through. If you grind it up, you'll get, uh, you'll get omega-3s. Do a little coffee grinder just before you eat it is the best way to do it. Good. Well, I trust the discussion has been of uh, some help to you. Uh, we've uh, introduced you to the lifestyle factors of hypertension you know something about how it's measured I hope it all makes sense to you now when the doctor gives you the number the high number the low number you know it's the working heart and the resting heart right and then <clears throat> the things that can raise it the whole concept of pump and pipes and fluid and how the kidneys come into that to take the water out and then the importance of being able to reverse salt sensitivity if you eat lots of fruits and vegetables, you'll help to lower that salt sensitivity. As a matter of fact, if you eat enough, it will go away completely and help to preserve your health and help you avoid uh, strokes and heart attacks and all those nasty diseases. Okay, I see one more hand and then I'm going to wrap it up. What's the difference between fresh and frozen vegetables? What's the difference between fresh and frozen vegetables? Fresh vegetables are generally soft and pliable. Frozen are very hard. <laughs> generally what they'll do is take a fresh vegetable and freeze it very fast. And it helps to maintain the, 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 the nutrition very nicely. I would, uh, you know, I would go ahead and, and you know, thaw it before I ate it. But it should be healthy and good for you. And it should do the same thing for your blood pressure, too. So that's good. Yes, ma'am. What kind of numbers are you looking for to take of calcium, vitamin D, and magnesium? Oh, you want exact numbers. Calcium, we're talking, if you're a 100% plant-based diet, so you eat absolutely no animal products, no protein, animal proteins at all, it's, you need about somewhere between four and 500 milligrams of calcium a day. If you're a... Dairy drinker, meat eater, you're going to need 12 to 1,500 milligrams because the animal protein sucks calcium out of your body, okay? So uh, that's the range. For e if you're going to take calcium, you need half as much magnesium as you get calcium. So if you're taking 1,200 milligrams of calcium, you should take 600 of magnesium. If you're taking 400 of calcium, then you should take 200 of magnesium. If you're eating your plants, plants have lots of magnesium. You don't have to worry about it. Most Americans don't get enough plants. Most Americans are deficient in magnesium. So that's another reason why a plant-based diet is going to help. Okay, and then you asked about vitamin D. Oh, man, you should have been at the last lecture. Get the video or the DVD, okay? Because the, if you get it up high enough, you get protection against cancer, autoimmune disease, and a bunch of stuff. And the levels that, that we are talking about, the RDAs, are just too low, we are recognizing. I'm taking 5,000 international units a day, and for most people, that would be very good. Okay. Well, I'm going to uh, wrap up here. For Thank you very much.